I think it's really important to understand inequality and why it will reshape real estate. The true impact of inequality is the rich are getting richer and many people are just not keeping up. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today, show another code cracker. We're going to dig into inequality, one of the biggest mega trends there is around the globe today and what it means for us as property investors. As well, of course, a lot of people today are not feeling so crash hot about their economic decision making. I want to explore what that actually is so you don't fall into the trap of ending up on the wrong side of inequality throughout your lifetime. And of course, we're going to dig into some of the real dynamics around inequality and what it can do to people, which of course is a bit of a deep conversation. However, as you know, I'm gauche. I'm uh, as gauche as they come. And as such, I try and make deep conversations a little bit amusing. So today, I want to tackle a tough one. We're going to go back to shame. Yes, money shame. Part two is here. And we're going to dig into what inequality does to the market, what property can do to human beings, and how many people feel like they're being left behind off the back of the recent price movements in real estate. Tell you what, I don't know if this show is going to make it to the end. The uh, Gospodar, the Hearth and Homer, is outstanding out the front of his house with a leaf blower in hand. He is ready to blow leaves. And in fact, he doesn't really even have too many leaves to blow. But for whatever reason, every time he leaf blows, it goes for a good half an hour. This show, of course, goes for generally about 45 minutes to an hour. So the, my rules are you've got to play the show in double speed. I wish I could live in double speed because I do not want to live, listen to my hearth and home and neighbor smashing leaves because he's so bored that he uh, does it longer than it, what is necessary. In fact, if there was a political party which I could vote for that brings back the broom, I would vote for it. In fact, that'll be my next t-shirt. Bring bring back the broom. Hey, I tell you what, I think it's really important to understand inequality and why it will reshape real estate. The true impact of inequality is the rich are getting richer and many people are just not keeping up. And why do the rich get richer? It's a big conversation. I want to teach you why rich people are getting more wealthy. The fact that most people with assets off the back of coronavirus who have stuck it out and have assets that they bought many, many years ago are just waking up with bucket loads more money than... uh, when they went into this thing called the pandemic. And it's interesting to understand and watch asset allocation and the redistribution of wealth pour into the top of the funnel and just seeing why rich people are getting richer and so many people are being left behind. So obviously that is a tricky conversation, but I want to have this conversation. I don't want you to wake up in 10 years from now and say, Sam, I listened to your podcast for 10 years and you never had the money conversation with me, the inequality conversation with me. So today we're doing it. We're going to bring back the shame, which certainly I felt as a child growing up, money shame. The reality was in my world, I grew up quite an awkward kid surrounded by a bucket load of wealth, my neighbors, millionaires, billionaires. And for me, I wasn't. I grew up in a strange uh, house that was rather like a house falling down. Uh, My dad and mum were hardworking seven-day-a-week people, 
battling to get ahead. Generationally speaking, they gave me a gift and I'll talk about generational wealth and why potentially your decisions that you make today will actually impact impact your legacy or your family for many decades to come. You know, the reality is one in five Australians today is living in an inequality state. What that actually means is they cannot afford to fundamentally live in the environment we've created here in Australia. You know, rental stress is a real thing. And of course, probably the biggest driver of inequality is not being able to own your own property. One of the biggest drivers in OECD countries of inequality is house price growth or property value growth. The reality is across the world, we are now seeing a property boom. If you want to know what the number one booming country when it comes to property values is, it's not Australia. We are chugging along. We feel like we've had a boom, but the mother of all booms at the moment has actually been in Turkey. But look, just about everywhere in the world, you can find property values increasing inflation. Obviously, the world has had to stimulate uh, getting through the pandemic, getting to a vaccinated place. And to do that, many economies have had to stimulate their property market to create the wealth effect. The reality is the wealth effect has come. Property assets have grown. Some property assets have grown a lot. Some property assets have uh, grown a little bit. But the reality is, for the most part, assets are more worth more now than they were uh, prior to the pandemic. And of course, the same thing in the share market. We've seen the ASX 200 reach all-time highs off the back of really stimulus and, of course, more money coming into the economy. We have reset the bar. And, you know, the reality is we've gone through a boom, but we're now sort of going back to a more recovery state mode where we're now seeing assets worth what they're worth. The idea that they will go back to their former value uh, is, odds are, not going to happen. So because we've seen property values increase so handsomely, of recent times, many people feel certainly like they've missed the boat. And I want to talk about what that feeling is and what it does to people's mindset, their well-being. And I also want to talk about overcoming the idea that you now have missed the boat when it comes to real estate altogether. You know, the reality is there's still opportunity in real estate and there will be for a very, very long time. Australia is very blessed because our economics is based around a growing population base. There's really nothing stopping Australia over your lifetime really doubling its population base. And for that real single reason, real estate is going to continue to be valuable. What's getting harder, of course, is finding really affordable properties in really good locations and uh, making them stack up mathematically as a property investor. Property investment may actually not be a thing 10 or 15 years from now as the marketplace morphs into a home buyer market first. And really, because that is really what real estate is going to be about, or, you know, buying real estate in good locations, which one day will be really wanted by the owner-occupier market is a real critical piece of the puzzle of property investing. But there's going to be value. You know, today, uh, many parts of Melbourne, for example, are still underpriced compared to other places. Many parts of Brisbane are going to be absolutely incredibly valuable into the future with the Olympic Games coming. So it is not too late. And the reality is a lot of people have woken up off the back of this property rise and kind of a feeling that they've missed their opportunity in life to transform their life through an asset class that they understand better than the share market being the property 
uh, sector. And I'm here to tell you it's not too late. It's not going to be too late for at least uh, another decade or so. And that really does give you ultimately another cycle to get things right. And certainly what that may mean for some people is getting outside their comfort zone, maybe not investing in their own backyard, maybe looking at other pieces to this puzzle to find opportunity. And there is affordable properties out there. You know, we've seen contracted markets as much as we've seen expanded markets over the last decade. And of course, that creates diversity of opportunity here in Australia. But what is real is the fact that wealthier people are becoming richer. And when we look at the top OECD countries, we can see that Australia is no longer a middle class marketplace. You know, we've got people who are making a bucket load of money at the top of the funnel. And then uh, we've got, you know, around 20% of society falling into a space where They just can't keep up. And uh, for a lot of people off the back of the most recent property boom, the reality is they are starting to slide the wrong way. And I want this podcast today to help you slide the right way to grow and beat this thing called inequality. Because, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, potentially wage growth is not going to be a thing. Creating more income may be a hard thing for many people to do. And for a lot of people, the idea of living well is being able to live in a community that accepts you. And for a lot of people today, off the back of the property boom, they're now priced out of their community. And that has a devastating effect on people's livelihood and well-being. So, I will discuss some of the darker sides of inequality and I'm a fighter for inequality. The reality is uh, I'm powered by purpose. My hashtag, if you like, is people, places and planet. I love helping people understand how to move through and not be beaten by inequality. I teach people all day, every day to try hard to to get to the other side of this thing called wealth creation through real estate investment. And really, uh, my hashtag people is about helping people. I do that in uh, my daily life, just training people as much as I can to understand this thing called real estate. And of course, uh, when it comes to understanding beating inequality, the reality is rising inequality in Australia is not so much about incomes, albeit it would be great if we could all get a pay rise to help keep up with the rising cost of living. But in Australia, it is all about property. It is all about housing, a roof over your head. COVID and the wealth effect that really the government stimulus created has uh, created small pockets of wealth for many people, which is great. People feel confident. They're spending, they're uh, buying things, which is keeping other people in jobs. And a lot of that confidence has come off the back of stimuluses into the asset marketplace. But with that, with a rise in property values, today you are seeing people scratching their head going, you know what? Where do I fit in? Who am I now? Where do I belong? Where is my community? What's next for me? And that uncertainty that many people are feeling right now is something we need to discuss, right? We do need to have the conversation because if you're going to end up in that place, you may just find that you're feeling rather overwhelmed by this world that we're living in when it comes to beating inflation and certainly beating the property space. Now, making your first million in real estate is actually quite hard. Uh, Making your second million is also quite hard, but then it gets easier. And this is why the rich generally are getting richer and people who cannot break into 
the multi-million dollar club are struggling on uh, the day-to-day. Now, I liken property investment to catching a plane. When you take off on an aircraft, typically the captain's going to say to you, hey, for the next five or ten minutes, we're going to bump around for a bit. There's going to be a little bit of mild turbulence until we break through the clouds and then we're going to find that clear air. And uh, for the most part, you're going to have a smooth flight. Absolutely same context when it comes to money. When you start out as a property investor, you generally have to see a huge amount of growth to get through the turbulence to find the clear air. Now, let's put that in real context. For many people, they're on a bit of a mission to replace their income from property. Now, remember rule 20, you take your income, let's call it $100,000, you then uh, times it by 20, that means you're going to need 100,000 times 20, which is 2 million, 2 million in assets paid off. Uh, that will spit out on a 5% return around $100,000. So a lot of people want to achieve that from property investment. That's going to replace their income. That combined with perhaps a little bit of superannuation would be a handsome amount of money to drive your life and get out of work. And a lot of people are aiming to leave work in their mid-50s. They are trying to do this as soon as possible. And one of the challenges when you buy real estate, you buy the problem of time. I've said this before, time in the market to get a result. So when we start out and we're on this journey to fundamentally reach this uh, net worth of $2 million, That may mean we're buying four properties for, say, $500,000 or, you know, three properties for $750,000, whatever it may be mathematically, but we actually need 100% growth on that asset when we start out to reach a net worth of over $2 million. Let me explain it maybe a little bit easier. Let's say you took a $500,000 property and you want that asset to become a million dollars. You need 100% growth on that asset. Now, that's not going to happen over two or three years. Even if you renovate, if you subdivide, if you uh, knock down, rebuild, you're not going to get 100% on your money in two or three years. You will over a 15-year period. And that is one of the biggest, basically, mind-blowing problems for property investors. To get 100% return on your investment, you're going to need time in the marketplace. Now, let's take it one step further. A $1 million investment to become a $2 million investment, you need 100% return on your money. And again, that takes a large amount of time to achieve. And of course, that again is why so many people just do not see wealth out of real estate because at a bare minimum, you need a medium to long-term strategy 15 to 21 years to get a 100% result from real estate. Now, let's look at what happens to more wealthy people. If uh, people have done that phase one, and they're now in phase two, they can become seriously wealthy quite quickly. Because if you want to make a million dollars and you've got $2 million worth of net assets and you want them to become $3 million worth of net assets, you no longer need 100% return. You only need 50% return to go from two to three million. In other words, the market doesn't need to do as much work for you to make a million dollars. And of course, to go from 3 million to 4 million, that's a 33% return. And to go from 4 million to 5 million, that's a 25% return. And of course, uh, the more you've got, 
the less you need from the market to create a million dollars. And the reality is for someone with a net worth of five, six million dollars, another million dollars is still a lot of money. It's a lot of money if you've got no money. It's a lot of money if you've got five, six million dollars. But what is happening for many people and what has happened off the back of the inflation we have seen is people are getting 20% growth on assets that they own if they're uh, controlling a lot of wealth and making a million bucks. It's happening that quickly for them because they do not need a full 100% result on their asset. And this is the challenge for many people starting out. You've got to go and get 100% return on your investment and you've got to get 100% return on at least uh, generally because of the way servicing works and borrowing money and getting rents to cover your debt. You know, you may need three $700,000 properties to double in value uh, before you get through the turbulence to the clean air. Then it gets easier. Then, of course, you need more time. You need the market to also work for you, but you don't need the work market to work as hard for you. And this is why the wealthier are getting richer because they don't need the market to work as hard and they will make a quick extra million bucks. The reality is it's happening to a lot of people. It's happening to me. I've come through the turbulence. I'm going on. I'm on the other side. I don't need a hundred percent result from real estate on my assets to make a million dollars. And this is again, how we are seeing the, divide happen between really the middle class in Australia. People with assets are leapfrogging ahead of those people who are starting out or maybe need a 100% return on their investment. And it just feels a bit stretched at the moment. And for a, for a lot of people, they're analyzing their net worth and going, you know what, uh, you know, I'm falling behind and I can no longer afford that real estate. And my I'm getting thrown out of community. And I'm here to tell you that you've got to keep going. There's no point in worrying about what happened last year or last week. It's what is possible tomorrow, which is, of course, what your opportunity is. Now, when you look at, uh, for example, some of the top 1% of net worth in the world, uh, the older you get, the more wealthy you get. And there's, you know, that famous dynamic that Warren Buffett didn't become a billionaire until he was 54. Why was that the case? Why did he become wealthy in his late 50s? Same principle I'm talking about is the idea of compounding wealth. Once you do the hard bit, the idea of compounding money off the back of the more assets you've got, you just need less growth to create more millions. And that's just really how it works. And if you study really the top 1% of net worth holders in the world, you know, you'll find that you know, at age, for example, 40, the top 1% have a net worth of close to $5 million. And they uh, uh, find it a lot easier to make another million and another million. And it's just the way it works. So your job, if you like, you've got to break through that turbulent barrier to the clean air. And again, a lot of people struggle with that part because it does feel like you spin your wheels. It does take 20 years. And, you know, I'm just blessed. I started, you know, in my 20s and I'm now in uh, my 40s. And guess what? Uh, I'm in clean air. And there's been really no other formula other than acquiring assets and learning along the way and allowing time to do its thing and allow money transformation to do its thing and you find the clean air and then all of a sudden the assets you've got will work for you but not need as much to do 
what you need in the beginning. So I think we've covered that. Uh, I've probably overcovered it. Does anyone feel like I've overcovered it? I think I've overcovered it. So I'm going to now move on to where we are in this current state of affairs of inequality. The reality is we live in the lowest interest rate environment ever, arguably more affordable to buy real estate now than ever before. Certainly living through some of the high interest rate eras of say 2007 when you're borrowing money at nine and a half ten percent i took out a 13 percent loan in 2007 uh in fact uh back then to curve inequality to make it affordable for people the banks were coming out with in 2007 40 year home loans 40 years because Society couldn't keep up with the cost of buying real estate when borrowing money was 8, 9, 10%, 13%. So some lenders were coming out with 40-year home loans to spread out the cost to run the asset back then. It never actually uh, took off more than one year because the very next year we had the GFC and it kind of poleaxed the cash rate, pushed it right down and, of course, um, Many of the lenders didn't need to, you know, expand on their idea of doing 40-year home loans. So what next to make it more affordable for people, really, uh, with the cash rate at an all-time low? Uh, certainly, I think uh, the government has done its job to create the wealth effect. It's made a lot of people wealthy who will spend, who will uh, now pour their money into holidays and um, updating their clothing and retail and all those type of things. But, you know, for people who perhaps are struggling, the government has come out with an adjustment to the tax rate, which again uh, is trying to accommodate this challenge that everyone is facing is that a lot of people aren't keeping up with the cost of living. And really when you look at the personal tax rate amendments, which are, you know, unfolding. Uh, we've had our first one, second one due in uh, the 1st of July, 2022. One after that, 1st of July, 2024. Fundamentally, the best way to understand it is a lot of people's marginal tax rate is being changed. For example, uh, today, if you earn $87,000, you're paying 37% tax then you jump up to a higher tax rate that is going to be spread out to $120,000. So what that ultimately means for many people uh, is they'll get an extra few thousand dollars every year to spend in the economy. But let's face it, a few thousand dollars ain't going to get you far when all of a sudden you need an extra hundred or two hundred thousand dollars to buy the same real estate or even today with where we're at with rental stress, of course, uh, more money to top up that rental property you're potentially renting at the moment. Now, obviously, at some point, we're going to see a bit of a rental crisis in Australia in the not so distant future. And of course, what that is going to come out of is low stock numbers, low stock being created, lots of people, um, you know, uh, that it, low stock numbers, uh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought, um, but the obviously, sorry, the border's reopening, jeez, got to give myself a slap, a dead leg, wake up. I'm actually doing this podcast early in the morning, which is not uh, such a normal thing for me. So I think I need a coffee. But hey, we're going to see a bit of a rental crisis because there is no stock and the borders will one day reopen. And of course, migrants will come back to the country because we're a freaking awesome country. What that ultimately means is there's going to be an imbalance. And of course, that is going to put more stress on inequality. Now, Today, uh, we are seeing up to 40% of people's income go into renting a property. That is very high for OECD countries. And of course, I always teach the idea that 
you know, we want to find a marketplace where people are spending anywhere from 20 to 30% of their revenue or income on rent because that sort of tells us that we're, you know, usually in the right part of town where people are making a few bob paps uh, connected to smart economics and the knowledge economy. But the reality is money is connected to our well-being and for a lot of people, they dodge that one. They don't like that conversation, but it is a real conversation. I guarantee you, if you've ever walked down the street and you've seen a fairly haggard looking person, economically speaking, they're probably, for the most part, in a form of inequality. And I say that because I often run into people in their 50s and you're like, is this person 68? Like, what has happened to this person? Why have they lived such a tough life? What happened to them? What have they been worrying about that has made them look so haggard? And it's usually a money problem that they've been worrying constantly and they live in an anxious state and it's created a huge mental health toll on them that has in turn created emotional impacts in their life, which has in turn created health impacts in their life. So the price you pay for having some sort of unfounded fear around investment and taking risk is huge. It is absolutely huge. The reality is if you study countries around the world and how long people live for, poorer countries, the life expectancy is less. Now, my friend Marcus Pierce, I talk about Marcus a lot, don't I? I think he's a genius. But he he has studied the blue zone effect, right, around the world where fundamentally people who live in close-knit communities, grow their own food, um, you know, walk around instead of using cars. You know, these people are living for a long time. Okinawa, Ikaria, Greece, Sardinia, Italy, Uh, These places and some pockets of those places, people won't die. They live for 100. Why? Because they don't have stress. They don't have money worries. They're living in their family home, which was acquired back when the Romans were around. They're uh, living a fairly stress-free life, but they're also part of a community which accepts them. And inequality, if you like, the biggest problem from inequality is the challenge that a lot of people get ostracized from their community and that causes a challenge. But again, going back to the conversation around uh, poorer countries, people live for, for less, it is so true. I mean, if you look at the life expectancy in Namibia, it's 62 years of age because people don't have money. They Money and well-being is connected. If you go to Monaco, and hey, I think Marcus should do a Blue Zone book on the wealth effect. Go to Monaco, close-knit community, people hang out, uh, Monacoans, which I don't think is the right terminology for anyone who comes from uh, Monaco, but Monacoans hang out. They're close knit. They love socializing. They love uh, every weekend going to the yacht club, going to the Formula One. Every weekend in Monaco, there's some sort of festival of life. And of course, for Monacoans, um, you know, they're just absolutely really rich, uh, but they also have a really outstanding community. And of course, uh, their life expectancy completely different to those from Namibia. 90 years of age is the average life expectancy for someone from Monaco. To live in Monaco, you need a few bob. You need money. You need to be rich. So rich people live longer than poor people. It is a fact of life. And again, go back and look. If you've ever seen a haggard person, I guarantee you it's because of inequality. Inequality, for the easiest way to understand it, is just not being able to keep up with the rat race, but also worrying a lot about your future. And, you know, the reality is inequality is a transformation. And unless you embrace it, 
Probably your legacy will be in passing on further inequality to your offspring. And that, to me, is something which is, you know, ingrained in me. Because when I look at, you know, my grandparents, um, for the most part, you know, they were they were just simple folk struggling along. When I look at my dad, he was, you know, uh, literally had to leave school early to... Um, you know, he grew up um, basically being raised by his auntie. Uh, you know, he grew up in World War II, literally a completely different world. But he took the ambition to go and start a small little enterprise, ran a market store, made some money. The greatest gift he gave to me was to send me to private school where I got to meet some interesting people. I got to learn from... Um, you know, some of the wealthier class, which I was not part of. I got to see my difference early on being unequal and I got to learn early on how that felt as a human being. And literally I got to grow up in a suburb which was quite wealthy and, of course, my money shame as a kid was feeling inequality. And of course, the best lesson for me as a child was that feeling because I was coached to overcome that feeling, to enter my adult earning working career, understanding that I was enough and my self-esteem was high enough to move forward. But generationally speaking, I have certainly uh, got to a position where Now, my offspring should have no problem making $100 million. Absolutely no problem. You know, there's studies on generational wealth where it takes four generations to become extremely, extremely wealthy. As long as the message is passed on that inequality is a thing, And of course, if you want to change the world, you're going to need a few bob to it. You know, I feel like I'm doing my part. I want to leave this world a better place than when I came into it. A big uh, conversation for me is funding schools and funding rehabilitation of rainforests. We're just funding now the big scrub land care in the Byron Bay hinterland. We're uh, donating money to the big scrub to create trees which last really, for generations to come. And I know that sounds maybe sounds a bit green or a bit corny or whatever, but the reality is money allows you to do some amazing things, not just take but also give. And when I talk to many people from migrant countries that come to Australia, I mean, what I admire about them most is their work ethic. They get it. Generationally speaking, their forefathers were not wealthy. And I've had this conversation with, for example, Indian friends that have come to Australia who, you know, obviously when parents were not the Maharaja of uh, of a pocket of India. I've had fr- friends, for example, that I'm good friends with now here from Brazil. You know, there's a lot of Brazilians coming to Australia, isn't it? We love Brazilians. They're crazy. They, uh, they do crazy things. They're very... Uh, instantly Aussie-like, if you like, because we kind of feel like we're a bit crazy, but they're even crazier. And uh, I have some deep conversations around generational wealth. You know, of course, slavery was a massive thing in Brazil. So if your forefathers were uh, held back, then generationally speaking, you're going to be a little bit behind potentially people who are here today. But it doesn't stop you because a lot of people here whose forefathers have done some heavy lifting for them to get them to really a privileged state, people rest on their laurels. They forget that the race doesn't actually end. Inequality can catch you quite quickly. And of course, that's the state we find ourselves today where Inequality is actually the enemy between us. It is dividing society. I sat with a friend the other day, and of course, he was very, very melancholy. Um, Property prices have bolted in his local community, and now he absolutely feels like a failure. 
all of a sudden I feel like a winner, he feels like a failure. Now there's this weird enemy between us. It's a strange feeling. For the last five years, he has been talking to me about buying real estate, but has procrastinated for five years. Now, rather than talking about where he feels like he belongs as part of community, he is now talking to me about buying real estate some 100 kilometers from his community. He feels like he's being pushed out of society. And again, the great study of well-being, well-being and living for a long time, you need to love where you live and you need to be part of community. All of a sudden, the real impact of his procrastination to buying real estate is coming home to roost. He is now facing social challenges when it comes to how his life works. And again, I think one of the biggest challenges from breaking through the clear air dynamic, which I've been talking about, is limiting beliefs. A lot of people have limiting beliefs about real estate. And today, I'm here to tell you, you've got to shake out those limiting beliefs that property is not going to work for you, you missed the boat when it comes to prices, because all that's going to happen is fast forward 10, 15 years from now, you won't be in the clear air zone and you may not actually have an economic outcome from your life working, going to your job every day. Procrastination is a big, big, big challenge. And I often see people who wish they got into wealth earlier and really when we discuss those conversations with them, it all comes down to some sort of unfounded fear that they planted in their head uh, at some point. And I think there is a few reasons people procrastinate. First reason is perfectionism. When I study my friend and his challenges and I really feel for him at the moment, I'm going to do my best to you know, chipper him up, uh, do a little jig in front of him, take him to the pub, um, do what I can to make him feel like he is not a failure and he hasn't fallen behind. But really, his undoing over the last five years of not participating was perfectionism. He wanted the perfect property, the perfect price, the perfect this, the perfect that, um, the perfect street, the perfect time, the perfect home loan. And perfectionism basically made him procrastinate to the point where now the real impact is not just money, it's now community. And I can tell you community is worth more than money. Being able to be part of other people's lives and share people's lives and, and you know, proximity is power. If you're not in proximity to the people you love, you lose power. When you lose power, all of a sudden your life experience changes. And unless you can go and find new community, you're going to struggle, right? I think the next th- reason people procrastinate is really just fear, fear of the unknown. I think about it. Think about the last time you procrastinated, right? No doubt it was because you didn't know what you're doing. And I think um, a lot of people just sit on the fence way too long when it comes to property investment or buying their first home or buying a property because of the unknown. They don't know how the contract system works. They don't know how what a rental return is, the fear of the unknown. And of course, that's just a skill deficit. And the reality is the easiest way to overcome a skill deficit is just to create better proximity around yourself to get ahead, right? And that may mean finding educators around real estate, reading books, listening to my podcast 65 times, whatever it takes, overcome procrastination and get going. Because the sooner you get going, the sooner you go through that turbulent phase, which will take 15, 20 years. But, you know, the reality is, you know, you got to start as soon as possible because 20 years is quite a long time. But guess what happens when you get through the turbulence? Making money from real estate is not as hard as it is in the beginning. It is much easier the further down this course you go. So perfectionism, be very, very 
mindful of it and of course the fear of unknown and I think the reality is you've got to ask yourself some critical questions what are you actually afraid of what are you afraid of are you afraid that the market might drop 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars on your asset so what you're holding it for a long period of time do not be afraid real estate is volatile Share market's volatile, assets are volatile, but their volatility versus the risk is very, very minuscule because at the end of the day, real estate, people need a roof over their head. And the government's backing real estate. Banks are backing real estate. Banks have got more to lose out of real estate than you and I. So there's very little to be afraid of when it comes to doing this thing called property investment. What are the worst possible consequences? You know, I've been involved in real estate for a long time and the reality is uh, consequences really only unfold when you sell. That's it. The reality is holding real estate is pretty simple. You buy something in a pretty decent location, you rent it out. That's, That's real estate. That's as simple as it is. Yes, sometimes your rents will go from 400 to 350 but also sometimes your mortgage goes from 5% to 3%. You've just got to participate. The reason is not so much about making money, I'm telling you. It is saving your place in community. It is giving yourself better proximity to live better. It is passing on a generational gift to your family. It is fundamentally being able to contribute to society. It is being able to do things which you never thought you were able to ever do before. And really, probably the darkest question to ask is, what could happen to you if you ignore the situation? Why are you putting it off? And really, when I discuss this with my friend, ignoring the situation was actually now the biggest problem in his world because by putting it off, Uh, all of a sudden the market is faster than his decision making. He has uh, taken over five years to make a decision and the market moves faster than that. Capital moves faster than people. I've said that before. The reality is real estate will outpace you if you muck around with it. And of course, that doesn't mean to jump in blindly and, you know, have a go at real estate. But I, I, you know, I think there are some some dot points you can go through to just make some sensible decisions about buying real estate or shares or whatever it is. But the point is it ain't going to wait for you. And that is the consequence of not acting. Now, for my friend, for many people I'm speaking to, I'm running into a lot of people that are feeling inequality. They're all of a sudden going, I can't live in my neighborhood because I can't go to the bank and borrow another hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. I've heard stories of people now being pushed out of townships and suburbs that they've lived in for 10, 15 years because they can't afford to rent properties in those areas anymore because of the evolution of money and time unfolding right in front of them, right in front of them. And my argument to that is why were you asleep? What were you doing differently? Why should we feel sorry for you? Because yes, it's a challenge and yes, and it, you know, mental health and, and social uh, exposure and shame is a thing, but we're all adults and we have to think ahead, not just uh, think the world is going to be kind to us. And, and uh, you know, I say that with the greatest love. But the consequences of not acting for many people today is now anxiety of the future. They are feeling like they are rocked by these recent property value rise and really are struggling to understand where they belong in this world. And what that ultimately is going to lead to, and you will see more rises of, is depressed people. Depression is going to be a real thing. When you're cut off from your community and you feel inferiority, you will live in a depressed state. And being ostracized from your community is probably one of the darkest feelings you you can go through. I know because as a kid, I went through it. I lived an inferiority lifestyle. I lived ostracized from my community. The cool thing, though, being a kid, 
uh, it's so much easier, I think, to brush it off because of the conversation around, you know, uh, you know, not having too many things to, to worry about beyond that. You know, I didn't need to worry about food. I had uh, my parents. I didn't need to to worry about transport. I had my parents. I didn't need to worry about a roof over my head. I lived with my mum and dad. So as an adult, though, the compounding effect of that is, uh, you know, a little bit more challenging, right? And I think when you study the idea of inequality, it manifests in two places. People withdrawing from community and becoming a little bit weird and or people becoming absolute narcissists that they end up spending more than they have on rubbish. They go out and go, well, you know, I can't uh, fundamentally buy a property, so I'm going to lease a Mercedes Benz. What the fuck? Like, honestly, that is the worst thing you can do. And, of course, um, again, feeling like you're not worthy just manifests in two places. And I'm seeing this today. Like, some people are going, you know what? You know, I'm I'm done. I'm done with wealth building. I'm not going to participate. I'm just going to become a narcissist, buying, uh, you know, fancy toys to deal with inequality. And ultimately, I think even more challenging for people, it's people withdrawing from society. And I guess, you know, have you ever been to a school reunion, right? You know, your five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year, it really is an evaluation test on how you've done in life. That's how it feels. That's why so many people don't actually come to the reunion. Um, and you know, every reunion I've been to, it feels like an evaluation, uh, test. And we call that an SET, a social evaluative threat, And when people are feeling like they're going to be evaluated, of course, that becomes a bit of a mindset challenge for many, many people. I guess, have you ever been in a room and felt like you don't belong? I certainly have. And that feeling of not being worthy or in a low social status is ultimately what inequality is. And again, I'm just here to tell you the real toll of not participating in real estate is feeling like you're not worthy. And ultimately, that feeling can lead to all sorts of dark places, which can take you on a direction where you don't want to go for years. You can feel depressed, anxious. You can um, end up feeling rather haggard. And I don't think that's a place where you want to end up. You know, there's some statistics from OECD countries that people who are in the inequality state are just more likely to feel like, you know, they attempt to do things like suicide and things like that. Now, I don't want to go too much further because, you know, anyone feeling sad from this podcast, um, you know, reach out to me, reach out to to your loved ones but the reality is um you know this is the real conversation this is the real conversation of being cut off from your community how do you avoid being cut off your community you play the game of life as part of playing the game of life you've got to play the game of economics and i guess my real job is simply to guide people through a doorway right because uh you know here's the truth about money you know, and I put this little phrase in a book I once wrote, happier is the man that lives in a tent with the woman he loves than in a mansion all by himself. And I tell you what, I lived in a mansion all by myself. And that saying absolutely is true. Happier is the man that lives in a tent with the woman he loves than lives in a mansion all by himself. All that fundamentally is saying is happier is the person, man or woman, who's connected to community, who's uh, acknowledged by community than um, in this world where they don't belong. And again, I think, you know, one of the challenges you've got to overcome when it comes to thinking about real estate is not going to make you rich quick. Real estate will make you rich 
you've just got to go through a phase to climb out of the turbulence and that as much as anything is a gift because it will help you see life through a different lens when you get to go through pain you get to know yourself so well and there's no greater pain than holding on to real estate for 15 or 20 years and then becoming wealthy. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. If you like today's podcast, feel free to leave me a review. I will catch you next time on a fun-filled episode of the Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.